I've been really looking forward to this one. Today we're checking out a telescope that promises a lot in a very small package, the SV Boney MK127. Just look at this thing, it's tiny, it weighs practically nothing, you can hold it in just one hand, but don't let that fool you, the amount of magnification you can get out of this thing is kind of crazy. On paper it looks like a real contender for anyone who wants a compact scope with serious reach, but we know how it is, specs just don't tell the whole story, so I have my hands on one and I wanted to see it for myself. My name is Lutza and you're watching The Space Koala. The way this little telescope works is actually really clever. It's a Maxidov design, which is part of the same catadioptric family as the very famous and popular schmidt cassegrain telescopes like the Celestron C8 that so many people know and love. The principle is similar, but instead of a thin Schmidt corrector plate at the front, the Maxidov uses a thick meniscus lens at the front, which helps control aberrations and gives you those sharp, high contrast views. Here's how the light path goes. The light comes first in through that meniscus, a thick curved piece of glass that corrects the image and keeps it sharp. From there, the light bounces all the way to the big primary mirror at the back of the scope. The primary then sends it forward again, but this time it hits the secondary mirror, which is mounted right in the center of that front lens. And finally, the light goes back out through a hole in the middle of the primary mirror out the back of the scope, and that's where you attach your diagonal eyepiece, your camera, what have you. For focusing, you don't have an external focuser, you're not moving the eyepiece, you're actually shifting the whole primary mirror itself back and forth. And that's the whole trick of this folded design. The light path is bouncing around inside, so even though Though the telescope is tiny, the effective focal length is actually huge. How long is that focal length after all that bouncing around inside the tube? About 1500 millimeters and with an aperture of 127 millimeters that gives you a focal ratio of f11.8. That's natively a very long and slow system, but it's also what gives you those crisp close-ups of small objects like the moon, the planets, or compact deep sky targets. So what do we actually get in the package? Well, this is sold as an OTA only, so you don't get a finder, a diagonal, or eyepieces. Those are on you, but S.V. Boney does include some useful things to get you started. You get both a two inch and a one and a quarter inch visual back, plus the dovetail already attached. There are also two mini Vixen mounting points on the tube, which is really handy because it gives you space for a finder scope or even something like a mini PC or an ASI Air if you want to run it from a computer. And then here's the real surprise. They throw in a 0.65 times reducer. That takes the native focal length of 1500 millimeters down to about 975. That's extremely unusual for a Maxitoff since these scopes are normally stuck as slow long focal length instruments, but with the reducer in place it suddenly becomes much faster, still not fast, and that makes it a lot more practical for photography. As for mounts, I ended up using the telescope on a few different ones, just whatever I had set up at the time. Every single one of them was a complete overkill for such a tiny scope as it weighs only about 2.9 kilograms, so I don't even own anything small enough to match it. But that's also kind of the point, you could easily run this on something like a Skywatcher Star Adventure GTI and not be anywhere near the weight limit. I've had the MK127 uh, for a little bit now and during this time I've been able to try it on a whole mix of targets. I've used it visually on the moon in a whole lot of different phases, on brighter deep sky objects, and of course on the planets. The moon in particular was a highlight. The views were beautiful with really crisp detail across the surface. The dual speed focuser made it super easy to fine tune the focus at any magnification, and the stars came through as tiny pinpoint dots, which gave me some gorgeous views on globular clusters like M13. In visual, I tested it with both of the visual backs. With my 2 inch 31 millimeter eyepiece, I was at about 48 times magnification, and then with a one and a quarter inch 9 millimeter eyepiece, I was pushing it up to around 166 times. Personally, I found I preferred the lower magnification for most objects, 
But when it came to clusters, the higher magnification was really necessary to split the stars cleanly. The trade-off was uh, that the image looked a lot fainter, so you definitely notice the balance between brightness and resolution. As I mentioned at the beginning, this telescope doesn't come with a finder scope, and at this focal length, that can be a bit of a challenge. Sometimes even just getting started with a three-star alignment on the mount is tricky if you can't actually find the star in the eyepiece. So at first I tried to get creative and construct a finder scope of my own by matching a little eyepiece to one of my mini guide scopes. It actually worked surprisingly well, but then I had a better idea since I already had the ASI Air connected to the MK127, I decided to just turn the guide scope into a digital finder. So I put a planetary camera in the back of the guide scope, aligned it in parallel with the main scope, and let the ASI Air's place solving do the work. From that point on, every target I selected was exactly in the eyepiece without even touching a three-star alignment. It made visual observing so much easier and so much fun that I'm seriously thinking about using this trick during my outreach events in the future just to save time on setup and make the whole experience smoother. I mentioned already how happy I was with the visual experience and honestly that's where this telescope shines. But you know me, at the end of the day I'm an astrophotographer so of course I wanted to see what it could do once I put a camera on it. To begin I did a star test this telescope arrived mostly collimated and I was just planning to do a small adjustment after having seen the defocus star pattern visually. Uh, but here's the thing, the little cap at the front that's supposed to cover the secondary mirror collimation screws, I just could not get it off. Supposedly it should come off easily, but no matter what I tried, with my hands, rubber gloves, I even called in backup it just wouldn't budge. So in the eyepiece I could definitely see that the diffraction rings weren't perfectly concentric, but photographically it didn't really show up in the images. So in practice it still worked fine, but the inability to access the collimation screws is definitely very frustrating also because I know that I could have had an even better view. I have seen some other people's reviews on YouTube and I have spoken to some of them and I seem to be the only one that was not able to remove this cap and I'm sure that I will eventually find the right tool to do it. It's just not that easy to access being inside this concave meniscus lens. Like I said earlier, it's designed to be used with the 0.65 reducer for imaging, which brings the focal length down from 1500 millimeters to about 975. I set it up on multiple nights, sometimes with a mono camera and sometimes with a color camera. The only issue was that my cameras have an M54 interface, while the telescope only comes with an M42 adapter. I didn't have a proper piece to make the connection with the correct back focus, so I ended up makeshifting an adapter ring. The first night I tried it without that, I was off by two or three millimeters in back focus, and you could really see it in the images. Even though this is a slow telescope, the reducer is very sensitive to back focus, especially if you're pushing it with like an APS-C sensor. But once I sorted out the spacing with my custom adapter, it worked and I was able to image with it. I tested it on a variety of targets over different nights. At one point, I even tried putting a planetary camera in the back and doing some live stacking on a small planetary nebula, the ring nebula. I, I was definitely struggling, but I did just about five minutes and you can see the ring nebula so we have an image. Uh, I think it is absolutely possible if you invest some time into it, even if we don't push it all the way to the limit with such a tiny uh, sensor. I was using an IMX715. This is where this telescope really makes sense photographically. Very compact but bright objects where the long focal length gives you the close-up shots. Naturally I also used it on the planets and the moon and I'll show you some of those images close up later on. The scene conditions um, weren't always ideal for the planets. Um, Jupiter and Venus are still very low in the morning but I still got some results that I'm happy with. So yes it can be used photographically but it does come with some caveats. I think that's about everything I can tell you about using this telescope out in the field, so let's jump over to the computer, take a look at how the pictures actually turned out, and figure out what the verdict is on this little scope. All right. 
right, let's start with the solar system. Here's the best image I managed to get of Saturn, quite a bit of rain detail. Then here's a close-up of the moon. I also tried different cameras with different pixel sizes, which gave me different resolutions. The best results came when I used my ADC, my atmospheric dispersion corrector, together with a color camera that has really small pixels, the IMX715. And that Saturn shot really shows the potential of what is possible with this telescope in planetary photography. I even put together a small solar system collage for fun. Uranus and Neptune showed up too, but at this aperture they are just tiny disks with a hint of color. Jupiter, on the other hand, looked great. You can clearly see the Galilean moons and all the bands too. Here's the moon again, this time with the reducer and a larger sensor. It's a nice wide shot. You can fit the entire moon in frame, but I do feel that the reducer takes away from the crispness you get at full focal length. For this one, I didn't even do lucky imaging. I just stacked about 100 frames to pull out a little bit of color. Fit onto the deep sky targets. Here is the elephant's trunk nebula with just 30 minutes, no filter with a color camera. And then here's M33. Just under an hour, another decent result. And finally, here's M45 with about 80 minutes of exposure. This one was a bit of a disappointment. I specifically picked the Pleiades because of the bright stars. I wanted to see if any weird artifacts would show up and sure enough some of the stars have these big double arc shapes. That's especially obvious on the lower star right here. I'm quite sure that's from the reducer. The correction overall was actually better than I expected for an APS-C sensor, though the system is extremely sensitive to back focus. There's also some tilt visible, which is no doubt my sensor, not the telescope, but the point is this system is not very forgiving. You'd probably want to use a smaller sensor like a 533 or a 294. A 585 would also work, but with such a tiny field of view, you're really only shooting small planetary nebulas and not much else. So what's the verdict? In terms of competition, the best known alternative is the Skywatcher Skymax 127. I haven't used that scope myself, but it's well regarded in general and owners tend to like it. The main difference between the two is how the secondary mirror is mounted. Normally, I'd say the SV Boney has an advantage here because you can collimate the secondary, but as you saw, I wasn't able to get the cover off, so in practice, I couldn't adjust it and test it out. Price-wise, they're very close. Right now, the SV Boney sells for about $480, though it is listed as 50% off the supposed retail price. Feature-wise, the SV Boney gives you some really nice quality of life improvements, a standard schmidt kessegren back, both 2-inch and 1.25 inch eyepiece holders, a dual speed focuser, and of course, the reducer, which is a very unusual thing to find on a Maxitov. The Skywatcher, on the other hand, doesn't include those extras, but it does come with the basics, a red dot finder, a diagonal, and two eyepieces. So in my view, the Skywatcher is probably the better choice if you are starting from scratch and you don't own any accessories yet. The SV Boney, on the other hand, makes more sense if you already have eyepieces, a finder, maybe another setup for wide field work, and you just want something that gives you a lot more magnification. It can be used for imaging with patients, but the real strength is visual, sharp, high contrast views at the native focal length in a package that's small enough to throw in a backpack. So those were my thoughts and experiences with the SV Boney MK127. I will probably use this as a grab and go telescope to view the moon. I'm able to get a very nice full moon view with my longest eyepiece and I can also get some nice detailed views by zooming in or, but I won't be taking pictures with it. I'll link it below if you want to check out more specs and details. I hope you've enjoyed this review and if you've had experiences with this Mac or with one of the competitors, I would love for you to share your thoughts with me in the comments below. Thanks a lot for watching and if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to press like and subscribe to support the channel. Nights are getting longer here in the Northern Hemisphere. It is a really good time to get back out imaging. I wish you clear skies for the upcoming new moon.